Unfortunately, there have been lots of bombings, lots of attacks. The closure is not meant to deter suicide bombers. It's meant to punish and put pressure on three million civilians. People do not earn any more because the majority of the Palestinians used to work in Israel and the majority of the Palestinian economy was based on the income of people who were working inside Israel. Now they cannot go into Israel, so tens of thousands of families just lose the source of income that they had. The education system is also affected by that. The student cannot go to the university. Mirzet University was subject to army closures for something like 18 times. The longest closure was during the first intifada. For five years, we could not set foot on campus. During this period, we organized what the Israeli army called cells of illegal education. We were teaching in apartments, in rented flats, in churches, in mosques, in gardens, in cars, and we kept our infrastructure. Even this attempt to minimize the damage and to keep the university going, they attempted to crush it. I went to college in the States and I found it very differently. Your biggest like worry about in the States is if I'm going to pass my class or, oh, I hope I have a lot of friends over here. It's totally different. You have to worry, oh my God, would I be able to get to school? Is there going to be a checkpoint? Is there going to be a demonstration? Am I going to get shot at? Are there, is there going to be tear gas? So it's like completely different. Here, it's just like you don't know if you're going to live or you're going to die, you know? It's, you're going to school as if you're going to fight a war. You don't find a tank in the middle of the road <laughs> on your way to college. And just the other day, there were two tanks and an army jeep, and they're standing right. there checking your passport and, you know, your, your student visa and all this stuff. And it's just like, we want to get to school. We want an education. We're, we're humans, and we have a right to our education. Places like the United States, people cannot understand what's going on because simply the experience is beyond their frame of reference. I can't study at night because my bedroom light is going to be open and it's across the street from the settlement. They shot at me. I was reading my um, biology book. I was studying for my midterm. And my mom and dad are like, no, get out of the room. But because um, they're, they're, they started shooting, I was like, no, mom, I want to get an A in the class. Let me study. So I'm sitting there and all of a sudden you hear something on my, on my bedroom window. I was just like, okay, maybe I should go downstairs. I couldn't study for my test. It's like, I tell my American friends, I was like, do you understand what I'm going through? The amazing thing is not that you have cases of uh, suicidal students. The amazing thing is the bulk of them, they try to carry on in the middle of this mess as if life is normal, as if they want to celebrate their graduation and they want to build their life and they want to carry on. That's the other part of the coin. The root problem here is occupation. Everything else emanates from there. The most severe problem is people who need medical care. We've documented numerous cases, cases where people have died. In fact, I believe that one of the last cases we documented was a woman who was in labor, who was not allowed to get to the hospital, and she and the baby both died. If people like that, if people who are really sick and really need to go to, to hospitals cannot do that, so I think you can imagine what happened to regular people uh, that just want to go to work, just want to go to do some shopping, or even just visit friends. It's like living in a prison, uh, a gigantic prison. Haaretz, the intellectual newspaper in Israel, ran a whole, like a four-page magazine article on the refugee issue. It had a picture of Tel Aviv University now, and what was there before Tel Aviv University? A Palestinian village, and those refugees are in Gaza. I think that Gaza is a main problem. There are lots of violations that you will not see in the West Bank, you will see in Gaza. We find it hard to monitor the human rights situation in Gaza because the Israeli army do not let us in.
Palestinians in Gaza had been under Israeli military control for over 38 years, where 1.3 million Palestinians were crowded together to make room for 8,000 Israeli settlers. In August of 2005, Israel dismantled its settlements and military posts inside Gaza and relocated its settlers. The media, along with Israeli politicians, portrayed this as an unprecedented sacrifice. In reality, it was simply a matter of Israel finally complying with international law. Although Israel's presence inside Gaza is no longer visible, Israel will still retain ultimate control over Gaza's borders, coastal waters, and airspace, creating a virtual prison. Refugee camps, even if there was no conflict with Israel, are just uh, humanly horrible. They're so overcrowded. And you have 14 to 25 people living in a space. There's no place for children to be there. No streets, there are little alleys, no trees, nothing. This, this is what has been fired on this neighborhood. This is a civilian neighborhood. There are no soldiers here. There are no, there are no military installations here. This is strictly harassment to get these people to move away from the border so that the Israeli tanks can, can move at will. 
They want these people cleansed from this area. It's that simple. And it's a way to get people to be humiliated and destitute again. In Gaza, you can see also the extent of house demolitions, much more extensive than in the, in the West Bank. The whole neighborhoods have been demolished. Hundreds of people do not have any houses anymore because they are next to settlements or next to the border, which is, of course, a clear violation of humanitarian law. People have no chance to get their personal items out. They have no chance to call for help. And this is far away from most media outlets. You are amongst the very few journalists who have even seen this. European or American journalists who have even been here because people are afraid to come or it's too hard to come. And one of the things we were told in Gaza by a very respected Palestinian uh, psychologist who had just completed a study of a thousand Palestinian children was that they had discovered that many of these Palestinian children no longer had a will to live, that they were so dehumanized and so affected by seeing their fathers particularly beaten by Israeli uh, defense forces, that the psychological condition is one of the dimensions of the conflict that is not widely understood. Palestinians called for an international observer force that would stop the violence. But this action was blocked by Israel. Finally, a group of Palestinian and Israeli human rights activists together created the International Solidarity Movement which has brought people from around the world of all ages and backgrounds to provide a nonviolent international presence to try to fill this need. Rachel Corey, a 23-year-old American student, went to Gaza to join in these efforts, sending back emails to her parents. I have been in Palestine for two weeks and one hour now, and I still have very few words to describe what I see. It is most difficult for me to think about what's going on here when I sit down to write back to the United States. Something about the virtual portal into luxury. I don't know if many of the children here have ever existed without tank shell holes in their walls and the towers of an occupying army surveying them constantly from the near horizons. I think, although I'm not entirely sure, that even the smallest of these children understand that life is not like this everywhere. It was uh, a Sunday um, afternoon in Charlotte, about noon actually, and I received a phone call. And my uh, son-in-law, Kelly, was on the phone and um, he asked if Craig was there. And something about the way he asked made me realize, I, I felt right away that something was wrong. And, and then I asked, why, Kelly? And he hesitated for a minute and he said, we've had some very sad news. And then my daughter, Sarah, I could hear her in the background. And she got on the telephone and she said, Mom, it's Rachel. And I, I think the first words out of my mouth then were, is she dead? of farmland and other property, uh, Palestinian property by Israeli destruction forces and villagers. And the bulldozer drove up and it kept going and she tried to move back but she couldn't move back and she got caught underneath. She got caught underneath the bulldozer. Many other internationals began to surround the bulldozer and yell at it and tell it that there is somebody there and it did not stop. 